Welcome, everybody. We are, um, uh, let me try to uh, set up our, our next, uh, next segment is, is entitled, the next segment is entitled Defining Health Issues in America. And so I, I you, when you came to uh, an event, a launch event for a, uh, the Lancet Commission on Global Health and Law, you may have been surprised to see a panel that focuses on the U.S. But I think if you've been listening to the, 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 our discussions earlier today, and looking at the themes in the Lancet report, I think you'll see that the lines between domestic and, and global health are completely and permanently blurred, as they should be. Um, the whole theme of this panel, frankly, is that the US, US health is part of global health, and there's no way, and, and global health isn't about health that goes on in other places, across borders, or in places that get assistance. We're part of that discussion. Um, and and I, I think if you, uh, in, in particular, I, I, I hope the commission's report um, makes the case persuasively, one, that law affects health in multiple and complex ways. Two, that legal determinants of health are powerful and frequently underappreciated when assessing why and how we have health issues. And that three, that all countries, including ours, need to realize the full potential of the law if they're, they hope to advance health with justice. And so one of the things it seems to me that we need to do in our country, like we would want to do in any other country in which we'd be working, and, and, uh, is to, to, to do a couple things. One is examine our own domestic laws and see which ones affect, uh, are effectively address our health challenges or not, and we know that we have issues and problems. Two, consider whether other countries um, can provide lessons or experiences that are relevant to us. And finally, share where appropriate successful strategies for improving health that could be adapted by other countries. This is a way that ties together our domestic experience and our global experience. One of the explicit purposes of the Lancet Commission report was to, to spark this kind of dialogue where we recognize the interdependence between national health regimes and the international system and between countries. And so, to do that, we have got an amazing group of uh, speakers that are going to help us think about the United States for the next few minutes. I'm going to deviate slightly from Larry's approach, and I'm going to, just to save us a little bit of time, because we are running a bit behind, and I'm going to do very brief introductions of the awesome people who are going to be speaking in the next few minutes, and then ask them to come up in order. But in, your, in, in the, uh, the materials you have, you can see every person I'm about to describe has an extraordinary background and biography, and I would urge you to take a look at it as we go through. But let me just quickly tell you who's going to be talking to us today, and then we'll sit down in conversation. First, uh, Professor Tim Westmoreland will address why the U.S. healthcare system is broken, and obviously that's not ordinarily an eight-minute conversation, but he will do <laughs> all that he can. Among other things, Tim is a professor of law and a professor of public policy here at Georgetown. He was the director of the Medicaid program, and he also worked for many years on Capitol Hill for uh, Congressman Henry Waxman. Tim will be followed by our colleague at the O'Neill Institute, Jeff Crowley, who is the, uh, uh, the director of Infe the Infectious Disease Initiatives at the O'Neill Institute. And he will talk to us about HIV, hepatitis, and a range of, of, of programs he's working on. Among Jeff's amazing uh, uh, history is that he served as President Obama's AIDS advisor and his senior advisor for disability policy. Following Jeff will be Regina LaBelle. Uh, Regina it was gonna, is going to discuss the opioid crisis. She, was, she is the Director of Addiction and Public, and Public Policy here at the O'Neill Institute. In her previous life, she was the Chief of Staff in the Office of the National Drug Control Policy under President Obama. And she was previously legal counsel to the Mayor of Seattle. And last but hardly least is, uh, is Professor Lindsay Wiley, from the, uh, is a professor of law at American University. She has written uh, extensively on public health law, including with our colleague Larry Gostin. And we do view this as a welcome back for her as well, because she was the first director of the Global Health LLM program here at Georgetown. So I apologize for doing this fairly quickly, but I'd ask our speakers to go to, to go in sequence, and then we'll join for a, a panel discussion afterwards. Tim? Thank you. Sure. 
So as, <laughs> as, as John said, my assigned topic is why the US health system is broken <laughs> in five to eight minutes. Um, I don't think so. Um, I've been in Washington for 40 years now working on health policy. I came here to work on Carter health reform. I worked on Clinton health reform, and I worked on Obama health reform. And if the ACA doesn't work out, I've had my three strikes at bat, and someone else can come to the bat. And I certainly can't give an outline of those 40 years in five to eight minutes. But I have some thoughts about what can be made better. And as usual, my thoughts on health reform usually turn to Medicaid. When everyone else is discussing the hard battle of Medicare for all, I want to join in the easier, or advise that we join in, the easier effort of Medicaid for more. Um, especially, <laughs> especially in a forum like this one, because Medicaid is our largest federal effort to address, as the commission charges us to, access to health, inequality, racial and ethnic disparities in health, public health, and disease control, all in one program. And it's governed by law and regulations of almost unsurpassed complexity, demanding law review, analysis, and improvement. My first thoughts about is that Medicaid is, however, politically stronger than it has ever been before. When I worked at HHS for Secretary Shalala, I used to joke that we administered two programs, Medicare and Med-I-Don't-Care. Um, Medicaid has usually been an afterthought to Medicare if it was thought of at all. Even during the Obama administration, there were sometimes mistaken formal references to the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services. But now the list of essential programs is always Medicare and Medicaid. The foundational Medicaid program for pregnant women, uh, children, elderly people, and people with disabilities is assumed by virtually everyone to be necessary. The debate, if there is one, is about Medicaid expanding to low-income childless adults, and some very red states have already done so, and even more so, more are on their way. Sometimes with their voters leading the leaders, kicking and screaming, but more states are on their way. My second thought is that despite this very strong public support, this administration and some governors are trying to dodge the Medicaid statute um, in pointless, misleading, and illegal ways. The waiver provisions of the Medicaid program provide great flexibility for states to experiment with their programs, so long as the experiment is to advance coverage for low-income people. Revisiting long-acknowledged policy failures, such as enrollment discouraging work requirements, is neither a real experiment nor an advance in coverage. First, most of the Medicaid families already have workers and, adore, and or exempt elderly and disabled people, and we know it. And second, the people who do get disenrolled are mostly lost in the paperwork, proving that they do meet the requirements or the exemptions. These administration and state policy schemes are just thinly masked accusations that some low-income people don't deserve health insurance. A return to thinking of Medicaid as a handout rather than a health insurance program. The first, I'm happy to say that the first court reviews have seen these as outside the law, and I hope the others will continue to do so. My final thought, because five minutes flies by when you're thinking of Medicaid, <laughs> is that federal and state policymakers who want to have some easy things that they can do to improve the reach of Medicaid have some things in front of them. While we have the complicated debate about Medicare for all, there's some very simple and direct things that we could do to make Medicaid for more. Most directly, we could go back and amend the ACA to restart the complete federal 100% match for any state that belatedly now chooses to expand Medicaid. Yes, the state should have done it from the outset, but better late than never. And yes, the Supreme Court should have left a requirement for states to expand, but 36 states have accepted the option, and we should encourage, do everything we can to encourage more. And yes, the financial case in favor of expansions benefits to the states is already very strong, but the requirement of a 10% state match that will kick in next year provides too easy a talking point for those who oppose expansion in those states. It's simple-minded, and it's wrong 
but it's an easy to say talking point. And the federal cost, I teach budgets here, the federal cost from resetting the 100% match back to the beginning when the state starts would be minimal, especially in an era in which we aim in our budget resolutions to add a trillion dollars to the debt. In truth, the state 10% match was included in the ACA as a matter of scorekeeping and budget problems at the time. But ironically, I believe the delays from the Supreme Court's decision uh, to create an option have probably saved more federal money than the 10% would bring in. Eliminating the state match for the expansion forever and making it 100% federally financed will probably still be covered by the savings from the first ACA budgets. And federal policymakers who are interested in Medicare for all or a federal public option in exchanges should also be interested in making it easy for states to provide a Medicaid buy-in for uninsured people. For many people um, in the system, the subsidies in the ACA's exchanges are just not enough to make the available private health insurance truly accessible. These are those people in the family glitch, a mistake in the statute, and who get too small a subsidy. These are people in states that don't have much of a private health insurance market, and Medicaid comes with, a, um, with a, an intact system of providers. There are those people who are ineligible because of their immigrant status, and there are middle-income people whose other expenses crowd out their insurance purchasability. Yet Medicaid in many states would come with, as I say, a very strong network and full benefits. For many people, buying into Medicaid would be a financial and medical blessing. Medicaid is not the entire ACA, and the ACA exchanges are not the entire insurance market. But Medicaid is an insurance system which we have made, in which we've made great progress over the last 40 years. We have the duty to stop those people who would, turn, who would illegally turn back that progress, and we have some real opportunities to do simple things to move forward with statutes and regulations. In my brief time today, I would encourage us to do so. Thank you very much. As was said, I'm Jeff Crawley, and I'm going to talk about um, the HIV and hepatitis epidemics and how we move from planning to action. I should say up front that um, the work I'm going to talk about is really based on a great team I have. I have two great lawyers that work with me. Sonia Kanzader is a senior associate who works with us on hepatitis, and Sean Bland is a senior associate that works with us on HIV. And so my remarks really will talk about work we're all engaged in, and some of it, quite frankly, are issues we care about, but we're not necessarily directly doing all of this work. You know, I think at Dickens, it's the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, I think when I think about where we are with HIV and hepatitis C, there's lots of real um, excitement, but there's also challenges. Certainly, when I think about the communities most heavily impacted by HIV, the last few years have been really threatening, not necessarily because of their HIV status, but as trans people or members of the LGBT community, as immigrants, as people of color, they felt under threat. And now we have this new initiative where we're talking about ending aid. So it's, it's a real stark um, difference where there's both opportunities and threats. And hopefully um, what you'll hear from me is a message that um, laws and policies matter, but also we can't use laws and policy to fix a problem and think we're done. The opportunities and the threats evolve over time, so law and policy need to remain engaged. So I'm very quickly going to just give us a snapshot of the epidemic in the United States. So the U.S. has the most serious HIV epidemic in the developed world. We have about 1.1 million Americans living with HIV. We have about 39,000 new infections each year. That's too many. But I will say, compared to the high point of our epidemic, when we had about 130 to 140,000 per year, it's major progress. We also had been in a period of steady state for a number of years where we had about 50,000 new infections per year. And then CDC data shows that from 2008 to 2014, we saw declines of almost 20% um, a year, bringing us to our current state. Early in the epidemic, we knew that the epidemic was concentrated um, among marginalized populations. Then we spread a message that it spread to all parts of the country, all groups, and that's true. But what we're really seeing now is a reconcentration of the epidemic. Um, what you'll see at the top right is um, people who inject drugs represent about 6% of new diagnoses. We're worried that that number will start to rise, but as a reference point, that's a sign of major progress because at earlier points of the epidemic, there are um, closer to, to one in five um, di diagnoses. 
We've had major progress among heterosexuals and seen major declines. But over time, the epidemic has always been concentrated among gay and bisexual men, and it's increasingly so. Gay and bisexual men in this country represent about 2% of the US population, about 4% of men, but yet account for seven in 10 new diagnoses. HIV also very disproportionately impacts um, racial and ethnic minorities, and certainly even just looking among gay and bisexual men, the vast majority of the cases in the center of our epidemic are black gay and bisexual men, which account for about one in four new diagnoses. Hepatitis C is also a very serious health threat to the population. About 2.5 million Americans are living with HIV, or about 1% of, of adults. 75 to 85% of these people will develop chronic infection. 60 to 70% will go on to develop chronic liver disease. 5 to 20% will develop cirrhosis, and 1 to 5 will die. And I would note that a number of diseases, about 60 are reported to um, the CDC notifiable diseases, and hepatitis C causes more deaths than all these other conditions combined. So it's a very serious threat to the health of the population. So now I'm telling you we have very, very serious challenges. Why do I say it's an exciting time or, or there's some cause for optimism? Well, science has brought us a long way. We, in HIV, we have effective treatments. We have a range of effective treatments that Dr. Fauci mentioned, but the standard of care for both prevention and treatment is a pill a day. We used to know with hepatitis C that we had treatments that were, had debilitating side effects. They didn't always work. Now we have a range of new treatments where the course of therapy is eight to 12 weeks, highly tolerated, and the cure rate, not just effectively treating, but the cure rate exceeds 95%. So the science has brought us a long way, but um, challenges remain. Now I will say, not all our indicators are positive, and I think it shows if we let our guard down um, we, we could see a re resurgence. So on the left, it just shows that um, this is based on some work we've done. I think we've sort of taught the world that black, gay, and bisexual men are the center of epidemic. Next up are, are Latinx gay and bi men, and I think people would be surprised that they're a relatively small part of the US population, but they count for one in five new diagnoses. We also have a raging crisis in this country of sexually transmitted infections among all groups, but again, it's highly concentrated. Two-thirds of new cases of primary and secondary syphilis are among gay and bisexual men. And a recent study found that 10% of HIV diagnoses among gay and bisexual men is caused by the fact that they also have chlamydia or gonorrhea. And then the slide on the right is just shows a, a new outbreak of HIV and hepatitis C in the communities of Lawrence and Lowell, Massachusetts, associated with injection drug use. So all of these are areas where, despite our progress and optimism, we're, we're, um, we're struggling. The other thing where I'd say that we're, we're not always making progress is this is a map of obviously the United States. It shows um, we have these great treatments for hepatitis C that can cure. This shows access restrictions. And without getting into all the details, the red states mean that you have to have what's called a liver um, score of F3, means indicating the most severe scarring of the liver before you're eligible for treatment. So have a, tr a treatment that could cure you, but we wait until you have advanced disease. Many people believe that this violates the Medicaid law, and there's active litigation. But again, it just underscores that science can bring us so far, but law and policy need to bring us the rest of the way. Now, I will say that you know HIV started with um, marginalized populations. Fighting for civil rights has been um, an important part of the, of the response since the beginning. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a landmark law that protects both people with HIV and, and people with hepatitis. Um, that's a great thing that even today is, is improving people's lives, but there's still challenges or, or gaps in the law. Recently, the Affordable Care Act did a couple of really important things, as Professor Westmoreland mentioned. It prohibited um, discrimination on the pre basis of pre-existing conditions, and it created a Medicaid expansion that significantly expanded access to health coverage for people living with HIV. I think if I had to pick one factor for the declines in new diagnoses and the increases in HIV outcomes we've seen in recent years, it's because of this expanded coverage, because it's been a platform for us to make some other, other progress. But, you know, the law is still under threat, so we have to still remain engaged. So we, we can't do law once and be done. We have, to, we have to keep at it. Just want to highlight some other areas. HIV is often criminalized in the United States. When we talk about HIV criminalization, I think people think, oh, I'm hearkening back to an earlier period in the epidemic. Today, 34 states have HIV-specific criminal laws, or there are sentence enhancements for, for people with HIV. 24 states have used general criminal statutes to prosecute people with HIV. Now, these are not cases where people are typically prosecuted because they intentionally transmitted infection. These are cases where people are prosecuting for 
so-called failure to disclose. It's not always clear if they, if they failed to disclose. In many cases, um, no transmission occurred and people weren't even really infectious. As Dr. Fauci mentioned, people, when they're on treatment, if they're viral waste, cannot transmit infection, but these laws don't account for that. One of the things we always said about these HIV criminal laws is we treat HIV differently than we um, treat other infectious diseases. But unfortunately, um, hepatitis is catching up to us. So about 12 states criminalize um, um, hepatitis, and these are new laws. So these are new trends in some cases where, where we're moving backward. And again, the laws aren't really about knowingly exposing someone to the virus or actual transmission occurring. It's just exposing someone to your bodily fluids. In, in 2018, a, a person in Ohio was charged with four count, felony counts of harassment with a bodily substance for spitting at first responders during his arrest. He faced a maximum penalty of 12 years. He ultimately pled guilty to one count and was sentenced to 18 months for spitting at a police officer. Now, I, in the last administration, dealt with some of this in the HIV context. I'm not pro-spitting or biting. This really comes up in the context of law enforcement. But there's not a, a real evidence basis for treating one group of people differently. So let's treat all, all spitters the, the, the same. But it shows we're moving backward. Um, there's some other areas I just want to highlight that, um, again, my colleague Sean is doing some great work in partnership with local organizations, Whitman Walker Health, which is our uh, health center, but it's our major HIV service provider in this area, and HIPS, a sex worker advocacy group, to do um, really cutting edge work around decriminalization of sex work. This goes hand in hand with our, uh, with our efforts to prevent HIV infection and um, decrease vul vulnerability. I think he would say that um, efforts to use the law to challenge this have been unsuccessful so far. But in our local city council, we have a council member that's proposed to decriminalize it. And a lot of their, their work, I think, is really about talking to key stakeholders, understanding what the education challenges are. In some cases, these, these efforts re require multi years to build support um, for, for that. And then I'm not going to get into this, but you know, I um, dealt when I was in the Obama administration with syringe services policy. And now it's amazing to me how far that the legislators that were our biggest challengers fought us every step of the way about permitting federal funding for syringe services programs um, turned around and now some of their biggest champions. But now we have a new issue, and it's the same debate. Are we trying to facilitate drug use? And that has to do with overdose prevention. Uh, we, we have a crisis of overdose deaths, and a lot of pl pl places are trying to replicate successes in other countries where we've, if we're going to give people sterile syringes, let's give people a safe space to use their drugs, often under medical supervision. If people overdose, we can reverse it. Maybe, maybe we can allow people to test their drugs for contamination with fentanyl. This has been characterized as though there's this sort of lobby promoting drug use. I think we need to think seriously about how we reframe this for the public because I think the science is pretty clear about the benefits of it, but the, the public narrative has gotten it all wrong. So I'll stop there, but again, I think that um, science is moving us forward in HIV and Hep C in really remarkable ways. Law and policy, though, is the critical partner to keep this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning. Um, so my name is Regina LaBelle. I'm going to talk about uh, the opioid epidemic and substance use disorders uh, in the United States. And I want to uh, begin by thanking my colleagues at O'Neill, uh, Jeff, uh, Crowley, Sonia, and Sean and I. Um, a lot of our work uh, really overlaps. And uh, welcome our member of our newest member of our team, Shelley Weissman, who just joined us in the last couple months. Um, so I want to level set first by uh, talking about some statistics about the opioid epidemic. Um, in 2017, approximately 72,000 people died from a substance use disorder, uh, died from a drug overdose in the United States. The majority of those drug overdoses involved uh, opioids of one sort or another. Uh, and the increasing rates that we've seen in opioid overdose deaths in the last couple of years have really been driven by illicit fentanyl. Um, the CDC has identified three waves of the opioid epidemic beginning in 1999 and extending to today. And I, I know that they, the, the metaphor of waves is nice, but I think it's really a, a layer cake because one uh, piece of the epidemic really builds on the other. 
So we began in 1999 with an increase in prescription overdose deaths. And then um, as there was um, a decrease in opioid prescribing and efforts were made to decrease the number of illicit pain clinics, we saw, and there was a reformulation of OxyContin, uh, we saw a transition to heroin use in the United States. And so overdose deaths increased involving heroin. And uh, the third wave, which is the one we're in currently, is marked by an increase in fentanyl-involved overdose deaths. And that's illicit fentanyl. Um, that, we, that is primarily east of the Mississippi is where we see a lot of illicit fentanyl mixed with heroin, and that's primarily because of the type of heroin that is available east of the Mississippi. So <clears throat> we have seen a leveling off of opioid-involved overdose deaths in some parts of the country, and this map shows um, where the green shows where we have a statistically lower than the U.S. rate, uh, and you can see the blue parts of the country are really where fentanyl-involved overdose deaths are increasing. Uh, and that's primarily in Appalachia, which was really where a lot of the epi epidemic began, and then in the Northeast. Um, it is far too soon to declare an end to this epidemic, as some have called for uh, recently. Um, the four states with the highest opioid-involved overdose states in the country in 2017 are West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and the District of Columbia. Now, the District of Columbia rates are very high, primarily because of individuals in D.C. who um, use heroin, traditionally longtime heroin users, and they are the heroin supply in D.C. is being mixed with fentanyl, so people are overdosing. Now, <clears throat> uh, as I said, we've seen a decrease, uh, about 3.6% decrease over the last 12 months nationwide. Um, prescribing rates are coming down. Treatment availability is increasing, uh, but treatment gaps remain problematic. So a few important uh, figures to know before I get to this slide. Uh, first of all, there are 20 million people in this country who have a substance use disorder. There are approximately 23 million people in this country who are in recovery from a substance use disorder. And that figure is not very precise, but that's one that we think, because a lot of people keep it quiet, right? We don't like to talk about the fact that we have the disease of addiction or in recovery from the disease of addiction, but that's our estimate. There are about 23 million. So of, of the people with substance use disorders, 13% get treatment for their substance use disorder. If, you have, if you're one of the 2.1 million people with an opioid use disorder, um, approximately 30% of people with an opioid use disorder get treatment. So more than twice as many as people with a generalized substance use disorder. Legal and policy responses have been directed to close this treatment gap uh, and to get evidence-based care to people. And I'll talk a little bit about the importance of evidence-based care in a minute. Um, so considerable federal funding began in 2017. Uh, in 2016, piece, legislation was passed uh, that was authorized, and then I'm, I'm uh, directing this to Professor Westmoreland, authorization versus appropriation. So uh, money was appropriated in the budget in FY17 and FY18, about a billion dollars, which is the most that had ever been appropriated specifically for the opioid epidemic to close that treatment gap. Um, so that is good, right, that we had this increase. Um, and the money that was directed to the states uh, is supposed to be um, tied to evidence-based treatment. So treatment for opioid use disorders using one of three forms of FDA-approved medications. And those three medications are naltrexone, uh, buprenorphine, or methadone. Those are the three forms of FDA-approved medications that are effective at reducing overdose deaths and sustaining recovery for individuals with opioid use disorder. Um, and we've seen some really effective programs implemented around the country, and one I will quickly highlight because it's, it's a, a great uh, movement that's happening around the country. The state of Rhode Island implemented 
evidence-based treatment using all three forms of FDA-approved medications in their uh, correctional institutions <clears throat> in 2016 and 2017, they saw a 60% decrease in overdose death rates among their reentry population. Individuals who are leaving uh, prison have the highest overdose death rates because they are abstaining from drugs and then when they leave, uh, they will overdose because they're not being treated for their addiction. So that also that resulted in a 12% reduction in the state of Rhode Island's overdose deaths. So on the legal side, there have been cases that have been filed. Yesterday, there was a settlement in Whatcom County, Washington. Uh, on behalf of individuals who were in the Whatcom County uh, jail system who have a, <clears throat> an opioid use disorder. Uh, traditionally, the way we uh, have dealt with uh, people with opioid use disorder in this country who are incarcerated is that they go into jail and then they detox, uh, and sometimes they die because that detox is so painful, but they don't get treated for their addiction. I have one minute. So... My main, uh, in the one minute I have left, what I want to talk about is the importance of uh, our legal system is obviously very important. But really, look at the, look at the statistics. Uh, and the, this is a survey that was done in 2013. Uh, it's not much different now. And I think some of this might be because the way the language that's used in this may have driven some of the rates higher. Um, Study conducted in 2013, 90% of individuals surveyed said they'd be will, unwilling to marry into a family where someone had a drug addiction. 64% of em, said employers should be allowed to deny employment to someone with a drug addiction. And there remains significant opposition to policies directed at helping individuals with drug addiction. And that's the, the last piece. So we talk, they also, people don't believe that treatment works, even though if you compare, uh, if we look at substance use disorders as the chronic con condition they are, uh, people have a recurrence of that chronic condition at the same rate as other chronic disorders. So in comparing it to hypertension or asthma, it's about the same. But again, people say treatment doesn't work. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll say this is uh, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. What are the reasons why people don't uh, seek treatment? Uh, and, and this is constantly brought up. Well, they're not ready to stop using. Well, it's because we, it's the only disease where we expect people to self-diagnose, right? We say they have to reach rock bottom before they're ready to stop. Instead of saying, maybe we need to try some prevention where pediatricians are identifying risky substance use when someone is 17 years old, because that's when the disease of addiction starts. And so that we don't have to wait until they become, develop a chronic substance use disorder and then they're ready to stop using when they're perhaps experiencing homelessness or some other uh, aspect of that's common with substance use disorders. So <clears throat> certainly law reflects the values of our society and it's Law is a vitally important tool, and I'm uh, very pleased that a lot of states are bringing these lawsuits to uh, make sure that people get the type of treatment that they uh, need to get to overcome to uh, treat their substance use disorder. Um, but really, as we talked about earlier today with um, HIV and AIDS, uh, we really need the voices of those who are affected to come out to talk about this issue. Uh, and really to, uh, to develop more of an advocacy uh, community that can demand that our laws respond to addiction as the disease that it is. So thank you very much. I love it when things work the way they're supposed to. That's great. So good afternoon. I want to thank John Monahan and the organizers for including me in this fantastic event. I'm Lindsay Wiley, and I'm a professor of law and director of the Health Law and Policy Program at American University. I'm thrilled by how the Lancet report that we're celebrating today frames the issue in terms of the legal determinants of health. I'm a firm believer in the central idea of the report that law is a powerful tool for advancing the public's health domestically and globally. Laws and policies within the healthcare sector and far beyond it play a powerful role as social determinants 
of health. Law is a social determinant of health, for better and for worse. Law mediates the relationship between health and race, ethnicity, immigration status, sexual identity and orientation, poverty, geography, community deprivation, and much, much more. As Dana Bowen Matthew has pointed out in her excellent book, which I highly recommend, Just Medicine, the rule of law has been perversely instrumental in this country in enabling racism and resulting health disparities. Matthews offers this excellent quotation from a pair of medical anthropologists. The individual body should be seen as the most immediate, the proximate terrain where social truths and social contradictions are played out. Law is the embodiment of our social truths and contradictions, which are also embodied in the health of our populations, not only individuals. I'm also excited about the focus of this panel on defining health issues. There is hardly a more crucial question in health law and policy than this. What counts as a health problem? And which of these problems count as public problems rather than merely personal? We've heard several really fantastic presentations today on some of the most pressing problems of our time. I want to broaden the scope of this discussion a bit uh, and move it upstream and put it into a broader historical, cultural, and social context. I want to focus on how these tensions and social contradictions are playing out in two key shifts in public health law in the US and increasingly abroad as well, particularly with respect to NCDs and injury prevention. In turn, these shifts are attached to broader shifts in public health models and the models that shape public health practice and science. What we've seen is that, uh, that there's application of the public health perspective, including its prevention orientation, its population focus, and its social justice commitment to issues that historically and intuitively and powerfully are seen as personal issues and interpersonal issues, and reframing those problems as public, as matters for collective concern and collective problem solving. In response to the insights of social epidemiology over the last couple of decades, we've seen a move that many refer to as new public health to shift the focus of our interventions upstream uh, and to address the foundational social determinants of health, including economic injustice, racial injustice, and much more. Indeed, as Scott Burris has said, the grand challenge of our time is how we respond to the insights of social epidemiology in our work as public health lawyers and public health practitioners. And the tension over this approach, which has been highly controversial, um, is inherent in the tensions uh, that play out in our shifting models. So if we go back to what you might think of as the old, old public health, which is often forgotten, a miasma model, which was scientifically quite misguided, but, uh, but powerfully focused on poverty and on geographic disparities in health, addressing, at least trying to mitigate the impacts of, of these social determinants on health um, in response to early epidemiological studies linking health outcomes to neighborhood boundaries and workplaces, for example. And from there to the old public health, the narrow model that many libertarians champion or return to, um, the agent microbial model, which was much more narrowly focused on infectious disease control, particularly with an emphasis on medical countermeasures and mass adoption of things like vaccinations and antibiotic treatments. But the real tension is the shift between the behavioral model, which came about in the latter half of the 20th century, with, uh, with, a, particular, with a, a, a particular focus on individual choices as determinants of health, individual behaviors, a very personal focus for public health at the time. And this model relegated law and policy to the back seat. It focused instead on health education, on provider and patient communications, urging people to do better, to make better choices about their health. The tension between that approach, which very much comports with social conservative and cultural notions of personal responsibility, 
and the social epidemiology, social ecological model, which urges great skepticism toward the idea that our individual choices, that, that personal responsibility is what drives health, that tension is playing out in our courtrooms, in our legislatures at the federal and state level, and in executive offices across the country. There are two main objections to what we think of as new public health in response to social epidemiology. The libertarian objection has gotten far more attention, uh, and it's encapsulated in this fantastic quote from Peter Skrabnik, who um, in, in his book, uh, his screed against healthism, as he called it, the roads to unfreedom are many, signposts on one of them bear the inscription health for all. But there's also a progressive objection that I think has gotten far less attention, but I'm more interested in it these days, partly because my job as an academic is to find something under-theorized and do a whole lot of theorizing about it. Um, this is an objection that, uh, that Larry gave voice to when he questioned whether eliminating poverty, uh, homelessness, racism, whether there was enough to be gained by framing these as health issues per se, and whether those potentially minimal gains of that framing justified the risks in terms of the coherence of the field of health law. There are many of us, including Larry, who have written at length in response to the libertarian objection to defend a broad scope for public health law and action. Um, for example, we can expand our notion of what constitutes market failure, what conditions justify a legitimate collective response, expanding our ideas of what constitutes a public bad or a public good, and in particular, the idea that epidemiological harms and benefits, those for which we can establish an asso association at the population level, but not at the particular individual level, that those are issues where collective response is necessary and legitimate. There have been fewer responses to the progressive objection, this coherence objection, the idea about, well, it all sounds well and good to say that racism, economic injustice, that these are health injustices, but what is really to be gained from that? The most common response is that it alters the moral calculus, but there's not a lot of work for health lawyers to do on that issue. There are only so many ways that you can say that making it a health problem matters. I'm more interested in focusing on the ways in which uh, these insights change the work we do as health lawyers. In particular, that they dictate that we carefully examine ourselves, our policies, our interventions for the influence of social bias and stigma. And that we tailor our downstream interventions in light of the teachings of social epidemiology. I'll end with this fantastic quote from Dan Goldberg. In defending a broad scope for public health law in action, Either the social epidemiologist's contention is accurate or it isn't. If, social, if socioeconomic disparities are truly productive of public health, policies consistent with this narrow model, which by definition do little or to nothing to ameliorate social conditions, will do little to actually improve health in the aggregate. So many of us are working on these important issues right now, on ensuring that for better or worse, and hopefully more of the better and less of the worse, that law will take us where we're going next. Thank you. Well, I told you it would be a great group, huh? Uh, so uh, I, I, I was a little overwhelmed over the course of the last uh, the, the several presentations just about the uh, just the breadth of uh, the breadth and depth of the knowledge here, but also um, the commitment to justice and the commitment to, to thinking about health outcomes more broadly. So thank you all, I really appreciate it. So here's a thought. I, 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 my guess is that you all spend a little bit of time, like I do, despairing on the current state of politics in our country. Um, whether you call it polarization is the polite way to call it. For people who have a point of view, they may say other things about how we've ended <laughs> up in this place. But I was struck by all four of you, even in a moment which I think it is fairly, is highly partisan, where so often the answer is, you can't do that. Any policy idea, you can't do that because so and so, one interest is opposed. Even when Donna Schleil was talking about the complexity of Medicare for all. But I was struck, each one of you talked about potential areas where we could make progress. And I guess one thought, one question I have for everybody is, 
why do you think some of these openings are there? I mean, in a very fraught, difficult environment, it seems like we, there is some progress on, uh, at least on some of the opio on opioid issues. There's been some progress. Certainly, who would have expected? I mean, can't, I'll just say for myself, I wouldn't have expected this administration to lead on a, 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 a national AIDS program. But, but just sort of, I, I guess I'd, be, I'd just be interested in how, one, are you surprised? And how would you, I mean, we think about health law interventions or reform more broadly. Where you see openings, what does that say to you more broadly about where there may be other opportunities? And so I don't know who might want to start. Anybody want to? Jeff? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, I sort of have two, two thoughts. One, I think about there's an um, HIV outbreak in Scott County, Indiana. A community with five HIV diagnoses a year suddenly had um, around 200. At the time, Governor Pence was adamantly opposed to syringe services. Um, his health commissioner, who is now our current Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, was opposed to it. The facts on the ground forced a change, and th they adopted it. So I think that gives me hope. In some cases, the, the scale of the crisis. But I also think about just experience I had in the Obama administration with the excitement about um, PEPFAR. People like to buy into success. So we, in the Obama era, had an opportunity. Um, President Bush set a goal of treating 2 million people with HIV around the world by the end of 2013. In 2011, um, President Obama changed the goal to 4 million over the same time period. But what was striking was that everybody, the people most tangentially related to HIV, bought into the success and wanted to be part of it. And so I think that creates some opportunities. But the last point I'd make is when I was in the last administration, we very consciously tried to make this as bipartisan as possible. We eliminated the HIV entry ban. What we always said is this was a process started by President Bush. We finished it. Talk about the bipartisan support historically for the Ryan White program, which Professor Westmoreland has been involved with from the beginning. And I think there's opportunities for, for both parties to, to be invested in our success. Yeah, I think um, on the opioid epidemic, I mean, clearly, as, as Jeff mentioned, the uh, Scott County, Indiana uh, situation, that helped lead the way for <clears throat> actually uh, Congressman Hal Rogers, who's from a very conservative district in Kentucky, and uh, Mitch McConnell to uh, add language that allows syringe services programs to be funded with federal funding for everything but the syringes. So this has been traditionally a very bipartisan issue. And uh, part of that is because there's not a lot of politics to gain with this, um, probably because of the stigmatized nature of the population. Uh, so it, it uh, and, and also, um, I spent more time in Appalachia in red states than I spent in a lot of blue states at the time because that's not where, where the epidemic was. So we made a really concerted effort to make it bipartisan, and I think that so far um, it has remained a bipartisan issue. I, uh, on Medicaid issues, um, I'd first observe that some of our best progress in expanding Medicaid over the last 40 years, not counting the ACA, which obviously was a big leap, was under hostile administrations, under uh, the Bush, uh, the Reagan administration and then Bush one administration, both of them opposing it, but the Congress expanding it on a bipartisan basis. And these days, I would say what I think is driving the, um, the discussion of Medicaid expansion, especially in red states, is what Jeff alluded to of the facts on the ground, or more likely the lives on the ground, where people understand the far reaches of Medicaid in a way that they used not to. They used to think it was just those poor people over there. And now I think people can identify um, people who, because of job situations, or because of disability status, or because of age, um, depend on the Medicaid program in a way that they didn't expect. So I think once people realize that it reaches people they know, um, and the real lives that, um, as I said during my presentation, the public is leading the leaders in some of the circumstance. Yeah, I think Tim makes an excellent point about affecting people you know, and I think that's obviously been an important um, aspect of the response to the opioid crisis too. I wonder whether some of the stigma data that was so powerful that you, that you put up, whether any of that's changed even in the last couple of years as um, the face of drug addiction becomes your family member, your neighbor, when you realize it's not about marrying into a family with a drug addict, but marrying, uh, being having people who use drugs in your family who are very much affected by that now. Um, I was so excited to see uh, when 
when Medicaid was put under threat as part of the threat to the ACA, people coming out as Medicaid recipients on social media, I am the face of Medicaid, you know, it's not this stereotype that you have in mind. I think what's problematic about that is there are so many problems where there's not a face um, or where the face doesn't, doesn't look like, um, uh, doesn't look like those who are in power, doesn't look like those who have their hands on the levers. Um, and I think in public health, that's always a constant struggle. So I think there are issues where we can, where we can gain traction. Another example that we haven't addressed as much today is um, maternal mortality, particularly for black women in this country, as there have been faces mm -hmm. put on that crisis as well. We've seen the response um, uh, uh, come, come up, but, uh, but there are areas that I wanna keep, keep tabs on as well where that's harder to do. Well, and actually, I, I want to pivot a little off of, of your last presentation, Lindsay, because I think you did put on the table the complexity of going to issues that are more, on, that at least right now in our political debate are more complicated and, and are not uh, and are not susceptible maybe to having a face that will mobilize bipartisan support. Issues like racism, uh, structural racism, um, uh, immigration, looking at people who aren't part of it. So I guess one thought question I have here is, do you all see a, we, we, clearly there's a, a, an opportunity here to look at the facts on the ground, real people to, to build a coalition. Do you see an opportunity here to build a broader coalition as we go upstream to use your metaphor, or as we start to take on issues that are even harder than what we're talking about here? It strikes me that that will be challenging. I don't know if you've given it. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I, I think, when I think about health justice, I look to the lessons of other activist movements, environmental justice, reproductive justice, even food justice. I think we have to connect with those advocacy communities. When we label those issues as health injustices, there's a risk that we're colonizing the work of, of experts who know far more about those areas than we do, but finding ways to, to link up these efforts can be very valuable, but there are huge challenges. Right. Um, facing those efforts as well. I think the one uh, area that I struggle with a lot on uh, the opioid epidemic is that I, I look at the opioid epidemic as the on-ramp to the broader discussion of substance use disorders. And the one thing that I think we have to constantly fight against when we're talking about the opioid epidemic is when people um, <clears throat> see themselves in this issue, um, they it, it, it's kind of the it could happen to anyone, the accidental um, substance use disorder versus that bad person who is right on the street. That it just shouldn't have happened to them, but you know they did something wrong. So I don't think we've reached the point where we see where we have um, you know the suburban kid who got addicted through no fault of their own versus an inner city person who has been on heroin for a long time. I, don't, I still don't think we're at the point where we see those two individuals as equal and that has race and economics wrapped up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. No, go ahead. Um, as we go further upstream in these discussions, I actually, forgive me I, if, when I sound very, very old, <laughs> but I actually think as you move up upstream in these discussions, you're talking less about um, campaigns uh, of the affected people and more about marketing to the people who have power. Um, and so uh, I, I understand, I think, much of what uh, Lindsay is saying, I concur. But there's a reason that the uh, largest aid service program is named after a white hemophiliac child. Um, it recapitulates the discussion of guilty versus innocent victims that Regina is talking about. And what finally got enough votes in the US Senate was changing the name to Ryan White. It's well documented that that was what it took to get the last votes. Um, but I don't think we have to be, um, I don't think we have to be Mr. Waxman always had a motto that said, God didn't intend liberals to be stupid. <laughs> um, I, I don't think we have to be stupid about it, too. I think instead of, um, may she rest in peace, Elizabeth Glazer, who founded the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, who used to come to our offices to say, show me the places where they don't like gay men and drug users, and send me to talk about women and kids, but will say the same thing. And that that combined 
intuition that we're all in it together, but some of us can market some places and some of us can market others. It seems to me that it's still a relevant skill. Jeff, did you? I think Tim covered some of the ideas, so I'll pass. Okay. Well, do you have a response to that? Oh, oh I agree. I okay. concur 100%. Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> she was, no, not, think, she was I, nodding. I think, um, uh, I think what you're saying is also that we have to use our privilege, um, those yes. of us who are in a position to market to power. And I think Elizabeth Glazer would have, I'm yeah. not sure she would have recognized immediately the diction, but would have concurred in it immediately. We're just <laughs> concurring all around. Yes, okay. Well, and I'll concur as well, but note also that uh, tactics matter and timing matters, and, and, and some of this is going to be a question of political strategy, of when you think you've got to make a judgment about sometimes a near-term step, like putting the right person in front of right messenger in front of the right audience at the right time can get you something. You've got to decide that that means not putting the person of the community that's affected in that place, but that they need to understand the trade-off. And everyone needs to understand the trade-off, right? And I think the lesson of the last 20 years for public health people is keep looking to see if you really have appreciated the trade-offs of doing this. Don't just turn into an advertising firm keep looking to see whether you're betraying any of the underpinnings of this too. I think that's right. And at the, I was going to say at the risk of not concurring fully, um, I, I do think there are times when the, the privileged messenger can sometimes get it wrong in ways that do we have harm a blind good, spot, right? Yeah. And so uh, it's, a, it's a careful balance. Yeah. And so let me ask you, uh, also kind of cognizant of our time here, but also reflecting on the commission report. The commission report talked um, is, is, is designed to speak to primarily a health and science audience, to make the argument that law matters. But it comes away with sort of two specific categories of, of uh, where we need to do more. One is to build an evidence base, more evidence for better law. And, and the second is to, to think about what we need in terms of legal capacity. How do we strengthen our ability to make the right arguments in the right places at the right time. And I, I guess I'd be interested if, if in the areas you all spoke to, if there are maybe one or more examples of places where we, need, where we, we see where, the, where public health, law reform really needs more evidence or better evidence and what are our priorities. And then another area, where do we need to really equip ourselves as lawyers and advocates to take the information we know and use it better? Um, so I don't know, because it seems to me there's lots of opportunities here. So I don't know who wants. I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> so the American Disabilities Act yeah. uh, covers people with alcohol use disorders uh, who are currently using. Uh, and if you have an illegal drug use disorder, it doesn't cover you unless you're in recovery. And that definition of recovery is somewhat loose. Um, there, uh, I think that that's a real opportunity to expand and have um, have a greater uh, amount of litigation in that area. Um, and there's such an overlap with, um, you know, individuals who, with hep C and the, the, that's an area that is ripe for uh, more litigation. And, and what I was trying to say earlier was that I think the stigma has a lot to do with why we haven't done more litigation in that area. Um, I, I was talking with a colleague here, David Super, um, who whom I admire greatly and who focuses a lot on food stamps work. But um, it became clear in our conversation that um, this administration is, uh, in its attacks on some of the programs that I think all of us would say we need more of, um, is doing such a ham-handed bad job of issuing regulations that are indefensible legally that I said to David, and I wish I, I would say to this group as well, it sounds to me like administrative law appeals are the forefront of preserving the revolution in public <laughs> health, um, that suddenly administrative law courses are a radicalizing kind of thing, too, to simply say, you can't do that. You have to provide some idea of a rule of law here. So I am surprised to find myself saying, I think one of the things that health lawyers need to focus on is more administrative detail, because the attack is kind of, the only way we have of defending our, some of our programs against attack is by second guessing how they've been promulgated. So, 
That is the most powerful appeal for administrative law I've heard in a long time. Anybody else want to? Are students enrolling in their courses right well, now? Well, we there's some professors who teach administrative law. Not me. Not me. Anyway, Jeff, uh, yeah. I mean, I would just say you asked originally about evidence, and evidence is really important. But I also think we can become immobilized by it. Yes. There's never a point where a policymaker is making a decision based on having all the evidence they need, so it evolves. So you're always just trying to make the best decision you can. What I've observed is often like the science, at least in the HIV space, is moving so fast. It's not always getting the scientists up to speed. It's our community is adapting in real time to following the evidence. You know, if it means shifting from one population or shifting, moving away from interventions that people are invested in, even if we don't think they work better. And so part of that is how do we bring people along so they don't just think we're, you know, being political or just like, <coughs> you know, doing something rash, but that we are following evidence. And, and to stay on that theme of the evidence basis for a minute longer, I, I think it's really important for lawyers to caution the scientists they work with about um, the impacts of kind of raising expectations, raising the bar for the, the level of evidence that, that we should expect for public health intervention. Um, you know, it, and this is happening in the courts every day right now. The idea that judges have become accustomed to the kinds of trials that they'll see supporting the efficacy of a drug, for example, and then expect to see that level of evidence for public health interventions. And you know, and I, I, on Twitter the other day, I saw this, this feud among very left-wing progressives about Elizabeth Warren's proposal about um, uh, black maternal mortality and, and performance-based uh, performance pay for hospitals. And it was this debate about like, well, the evidence isn't strong enough that, that that's the problem. You know, if we, if we raise our expectations to that level for public health intervention, that's going to be really problematic. Observational studies are generally what we've got here. And, and so, and that's a complicated message <laughs> to, to market. Well, the, the current evidence I'm focusing on is that in the back of the room, they've had a card up with zero for about <laughs> a minute now. So I would, I would ask if anybody might have any final thoughts that they want to share or else. If not, I would ask everybody in the room to join me in a round of applause for our panel. So, thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, we've reached that place uh, that exists between the end of this program and everybody's being able to get lunch. So I will try to make this brief, but, um, uh, but say a few words uh, if I could. Um, I think the right way to, after an amazing morning like we've had, I, I think the first thing to do is start with thank yous. And so I want to first thank everybody who came here today, both in person and people who are watching us online. We really appreciate your time and attention to this issue and to the commission's report. We're really thrilled that you're a part of this. I want to also thank all the speakers who really went above and beyond. Uh, to, uh, to, as Tim noted, uh, uh, discussing the future of American healthcare in five or six minutes is a little bit of an ambitious uh, undertaking. But I would note that people did an amazing job in the times that they had. So let me thank everybody. Maybe I, if I could just invite a round of applause for all of our speakers. <laughs> I, I also want to thank Richard Horton, who unfortunately couldn't join us, and his colleagues at The Lancet. Uh, to say they demonstrated patience and support would be an understatement over the last several years, and they really guided us, I think, to a product that we hope is really useful for, uh, for the community going forward. Um, we also need to thank, of course, the commissioners who worked so hard with us over the course of the last several years. They were terrific. I mean, it, you can see the roster. It's really an amazing group of thinkers uh, from the health and legal communities, from the Global North, Global South. It was really terrific. Um, uh, I, I want to mention once again, because sometimes in the laundry list of names that get involved in, uh, and that are listed in various uh, published documents, the most important names kind of get lost. I want to be sure we flag, um, again, Jenny Keldor, who from uh, our colleague in Australia, who played really an, an, a critical role in getting this document from where it started to where it finished up. Um, as well as our other authors uh, that are here today, Katie Gottschalk, Susan Kim, um, Eric Friedman, who's somewhere in this room. Um, so, uh, so thank you. And then, and then also to the whole team here that made all this happen. None of this happens by accident, and certainly Larry and I didn't do anything that made all this happen. Um, so I want to particularly recognize Katie and Eric. 
Carly Henry from the Office of Global Initiatives and the, at the, the main campus, uh, Mary Angel Rodriguez, who I don't think is here, um, and, and everybody else from the O'Neill team. So thank you very much. I <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, of course, Tim and Linda O'Neill, we wouldn't be here today. There wouldn't be an O'Neill Institute without their generosity, so thank you. And of course, I can't uh, complete thanks without thanking the co-chair and my longtime friend and colleague, Larry Gostin. And to say that you know somebody's a visionary and has created a, a field and a space is sometimes overstated, but not in Larry's case. So thank you, Larry. It's been a pleasure. Um, so let me just finish by uh, suggesting a couple things. One is, I hope as you review the report and you re reflect on what we uh, discussed today, that you came away, at least we hope, with a deeper appreciation of the complex and often underappreciated role that law plays in, in, in impacting health. Um, and so to use the language of a lawyer, because we have two audiences here, I hope we've made the case uh, that law affects health in important ways and that we need to use the tool of law more intentionally, more effectively to save lives and improve and reduce suffering. We can, we should. To use maybe the language of health and science, I hope the data are clear now, at least on some level, or at least sufficiently clear, to demonstrate that the legal determinants of health are powerful and that we need the voices of the health and science community in the debates over health of a law, law reform, um, because we know that laws will predictably impact health, and if you're not there, somebody else will be. So we hope that you've the cases, the, the data is clear enough to get you in the debate. Um, so I think, I think really at the end of the day, when you look at this, the biggest challenge is it's clear laws matter. Uh, what we need to fi now figure out how to make that happen, and a, and a better that means making bad laws less bad, or hopefully get rid of them and make good laws better. Um, so as far as we at Georgetown, um, Larry mentioned this at the beginning. Richard Horton referenced it in his comments. Um, I'm thrilled that the Lancet is strongly supportive of working with WHO to create a standing commission on global health and law. We really stand ready to be partners in that effort, and we hope we'll have a chance to going forward. Um, moreover, uh, we are really excited, as you may know in the report, one of the case studies that we lead off with in terms of translating vision into action is the universal health coverage. And so we are going to we're also going to launch a, a project to help what we call develop what we call legal solutions in universal health coverage to look at ways in which we can help um, parliamentarians, advocates, and others who want to know more about what it would take to draft universal health laws, universal health coverage laws that would do better and be, make and, and make a more just world. So, we're hopeful that that's uh, something we can uh, work with all of you together. In fact, I'd invite anybody here who's interested to to contact us. And then finally, um, the, the, the terrific thing is this report, this is, this is our great kickoff uh, launch here, but we are looking forward to having similar events in other cities um, in, uh, in collaboration with other commissioners. And so we already have uh, a launch uh, event scheduled on September 30th in London, and we're looking forward to events in Africa, China, and other places going forward. So we hope maybe you can join us in those places. And in any event, uh, we, we hope that you can be uh, part of this ongoing community. You're welcome to come. If, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put it on the website. So, uh, um, so with that, I think we'll just close unless there's any further ado. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it.